Hello everyone. Let's have a look at the introduction of Jenkins and what it is basically. Now Jenkins is primarily a build and release tool. It was written by the original community as a build and release tool. Uh, they did not target it as a continuous integration, continuous deployment, or an orchestration tool. It was simply used for releasing builds to production. But now Jenkins has a lot of other uses, like it's a continuous integration tool. Uh, it allows developers to make sure that their environments have the exact same code as their code repositories. So this is true for every environment. So let's say there is the dev environment. Now if Jenkins is used as a CI tool in an environment, it makes sure that every comment that goes to a repository is mirrored in the environment as well. Jenkins is also used as a continuous deployment tool. It allows you to push your code. Uh, in other words, every time you do a commit, it allows you to push it to production through a series of quality gates and a lot of tests. It is also used by some people, especially the DevOps community, as an orchestration tool. So people use it as a scheduler or an orchestrator to kick off their chef recipes, uh, puppet modules, or chef cookbooks, or um, Ansible playbooks, or any other ad hoc scripts. It's an open source tool, so there is no license for it. And although there are a lot of companies who provide enterprise Jenkins and hosted Jenkins, but the community mostly uses it as an open source tool because it is quite robust. It's written in Java and for Java applications initially. Uh, when uh, Jenkins was initially started, it was only used for building and deploying and testing J Java applications. But now uh, things have changed and it's used for many different applications. It can be uh, PHP, Ruby on Rails, Java, Angular, JS. Every application is now being deployed uh, by using Jenkins. Okay, now let's take a look at who uses Jenkins. Primarily build and release teams of organizations who are responsible for building software and releasing it into uh, production servers. DevOps teams, which manage the environment as well as the automation framework, like Chef or Ansible. Uh, they use Jenkins for running their configuration management tool agents. And uh, dev teams, obviously, because they want to have some tool that lets them deploy their code. So dev teams use it primarily as a click button thing. They can just go and click the button, and they can have the code in the respective environment. Now, there are a lot of other uses, but these are the most popular. So why Jenkins? Why do so many people use it? Why is it used in every DevOps JD, and why is it so widely used? Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. For dev teams... It gives you one-click deploys. It has got a very nice UI, which it supports, and there are a lot of custom themes that can be installed. Uh, it's free, so there's no cost attached to it, and that makes it very popular. Apart from that, it is robust and very reliable. It has a good release cycle. Uh, the plugin support is also very good. You've got plugins for almost everything. You've got plugins for database integration, plugins for Google Cloud integration. There are plugins for Maven and Grable, Gulp and all the PIM tools. Uh, you have plugins for integration for any third party. Uh, Slap integration is there. You have GitHub integration, Bitbucket, among others. So there's a good ecosystem of open source plugins, which again are free and you don't need to pay anyone for those. There are scripted builds. So in addition to the plugins supported builds, you can have builds which are scripted. This uh, gives you the flexibility of having your own scripts to be done by Jenkins. You can have multiple pipelines in Jenkins, so you can have your workflows automated using Jenkins, and you don't have to worry about manually clicking or scheduling tasks. You can adjust the schedule of the initial task, and the pipeline will take care of it. It has got good OS support, so basically it is run on almost any OS, Windows, Linux, Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, CentOS. Even through Linux, you can compile a Jenkins binary. And there is good community support. You can go to Stack Overflow, or their own community forums, and you'll find support, and almost every issue you will find in the first or second Google answer. Jenkins is inherently fast, since it's written in Java, and it's reliable. I've never seen a Jenkins server crash, unless you do something nasty with it. In general, it works just fine, even with rolling updates. Uh, with updates that do not work well, with your builds will still work in the same way. Now, we will have a look at the Jenkins demo, so we will be initially setting up this machine. And the base machine can be on AWS, on Google Cloud, VMware Workstation, or an active virtual box. It depends on what you want to use and where you have an account. AWS uh, provides you a free trial for one year, and Google Cloud gives you $200. 
Uh, VMware Workstation is your own local machine, so you don't need to pay anyone. So we'll be starting with the installation of the package on Ubuntu 16.04. We'll install the suggested plugins and we'll set up an initial user. We'll set up a matrix authentication and we'll be creating users for that. We'll have a look at the plugins. We will have a look at inbuilt installations like uh, Java, Maven, and Ant, and Docker plugins. We'll also look at how we build a Hello World application. Now, I'll be using a virtual box here, and I have here a pre-installed version of Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. I'll be using that as the demo-based platform. So let's just get the virtual box started, and we can go from there. So this is my virtual box. I've already installed Ubuntu 16.04. I have allocated 4 gig of RAM and 4 vCPUs because it requires adequate juice to run effectively. Now you can run it on 2 gig of RAM, but it won't be running the most optimal. Again, you can see I have given it 4 gig of RAM and 4 CPUs. Make sure you adequately adjust the RAM and CPUs according to your system configuration uh, operating system. Now, in a moment, you'll see the login prompt from Ubuntu 16.04. So I'll be logging in as the root user. And the password for this machine is Red Hat, root and Red Hat. Now, this is the open to prompt. I'm going to find out the IP address because I want to use the terminal here. So this is if config 192.168.1.115. That is the IP address of my machine. One more thing to note is that you should ideally have the bridged network so that you get the same IP address range as your local laptop. Now if for some reason it does not work, you can use the host only and the NAT adapters in combination. But since it works most of the time, it's fine. So I'll be logging into this machine using SSH. So Windows users should use PuTTY. So let me demonstrate how to do that using PuTTY. So I'll be using uh, So Windows users should be using PuTTY for SSHing to Linux machines. So I have a Windows machine here in a remote desktop session. So let me show you how to SSH to this machine using PuTTY. PuTTY is available on the internet at their website, so you can uh, Google that and find it. it this is at PuTTY.org. Make sure you download it for your specific operating system. So for Windows, you can download either 64 or 32-bit. Now I have a Windows machine here, so this is how PuTTY looks. It is a remote SSH client. Now the only argument it takes as a minimum is the IP address, uh, or where you want to SSH. So I'll put in the IP address, 192.168.1.115. It asks me for a username. Now let me increase the font size. You can edit the appearance of your PuTTY terminal depending on your needs. So I'll make it 16. It asks me for the username and password. I'll specify root and red hat as a username. So this is the PuTTY console or the remote SSH console. So I'm going to use this on my Mac. So Mac users should use the terminal that comes by default uh, so on Mac, you see SSH root at 192.168.115. So this basically gives you an inbuilt terminal. You don't need to install the PuTTY. Now, when I press enter, it asks me for a password. Just enter Red Hat as the password. So the first thing you have to do on a Linux machine when you are installing fresh software is to change the host name. To change the host name, I'll uh, edit the file using the Vim editor on, in the host name. So it's etc.hostname. When I open that in the text editor, you can see there is text there, Ubuntu. I'm going to delete that by going into insert mode by pressing I. So I puts me in insert mode, and I can clean this up. I'll name this Jenkins-server. And say I'll save this file. 
and reboot the machine. Now this is very important when you are accessing machines remotely because you have multiple terminals open and you should be able to easily identify them, at least in the local machines. That is which machine belongs to which terminal. A reboot is required for this machine to take the new host name. This might take a couple of minutes for the machine to reboot. It's rebooted now. If I log in again to this, you can see the prompt has changed. It says root at Jenkins hyphen server. So now I'll go ahead and install Jenkins on this machine using wget. wget is a command which allows me to download stuff from the internet. Now, since I don't have a GUI here, I have to download stuff from the internet. So I'll use wget for that. And I'll be downloading the Jenkins key initially. So I'll download the key from package.jenkins.io. Debian Jenkins IO key. Uh, it's available on the internet. So I'll invoke wget in the quiet mode and I'll type https package.jenkins.io forward slash Debian forward slash Jenkins.io.key. And I want to add this key directly to my local apt cache. So I'll pipe it and I'll type sudo apt key and hyphen. So this uh, command I've written uh, will download the Jenkins key and it will add it to the local apt cache. Now when I press enter it says unable to resolve host Jenkins server. This is a common warning because when you are doing a sudo the sudo tries to resolve your local machine so it's warning which can be ignored. It's because I don't have a local DNS server here which gives me a fully qualified domain name but after that you see there is an OK which means that this key has been successfully imported. Now the purpose of this key uh, actually uh, on the internet when you're installing popular software a lot of times hackers try to spoof packets and they will try to send you bogus artifacts or bogus IPMs which might have a virus. In order to safeguard against that and to make sure that the package you are getting is the one you intended there's a public and a private key and we just imported that key. And we have saved that, so whenever we install Jenkins from the repository, we will be assured that we have the same package as the Jenkins community had intended for us. Okay, the next step is to create a Jenkins.list file, so that my apt knows where to install Jenkins from. So I'll go to etc4 slash apt, sources.list.d, and here I'll create a file named Jenkins.list. In this file, I'll define a specific format for downloading a Debian package from a stable Jenkins repository. So I'll go into insert mode and type dev http package.jenkins.io forward slash Debian hyphen stable binary. Okay, and then forward slash. So this is the format which you uh, specify in a list file. This is the input of apt. And it basically contacts the remote Jenkins package repository to download the Jenkins binary. I'll save this file by hitting escape uh, semicolon wq exclamation mark. And I'll be updating my local apt cache to update the package repository indexes. Because I've added a new list of packages and uh, are at that remote location. And I want my local machine to know that there is a new list. Now, I want to add that list to be updated in the local cache. The command for that is apt-get space update. So this is a package manager for Ubuntu 16 and Ubuntu other versions. So I'll be using that for updating apt cache. Now my apt cache has been updated. I'll be proceeding with the installation of Jenkins using the apt package manager. So I'll say apt-get. Uh, Install Jenkins. Okay, when I press enter, it automatically finds the repository where I need to install Jenkins from. It shows me that the following packages have been installed. So these are the suggested packages. And these are the new packages which will be installed. So it asks me for confirmation. I'll say capital Y and press enter. It takes some time to download the package repositories. It's downloading the Debian package from the Ubuntu repository. So the download is completed and it has started to unpack the software. It's unpacking Jenkins and all the dependencies and installing them automatically. 
Now Jenkins has been successfully installed on this machine and one of the features of Debian is that it automatically starts the service. So if you want to check the port the service is running on, the Jenkins service, you can do a netstat NAUTPL grep listen and you can see it's a Java process which is running on port 8080. So you can also do a PS fax. And if you see there is a Jenkins running on port 8080. Now let's find out the IP address of this machine again. And let me go to that IP in port 8080. So I'll go to 192.168.1.115 port 8080, which is specified by semicolon 8080. When I go to that, we see unlock Jenkins. To ensure Jenkins is securely set up by the administrator, a password has been written to the log. This has all the feature, recent features added to Jenkins. It allows us to make sure that no one else starts up the initial admin user. So this uh, feature was not there before. And sometimes it uh, caused security issues. So if people keep scanning internet ports for vulnerable software, uh, this makes sure that the only person having access to the initial user is the one who actually has access to the instance. In other words, the admin of that instance. Now, since I have installed this on my local machine, my on my Ubuntu 16.04 local server, I know that this file is there. So I'll copy this, and I'll open that file because it has the initial password. So this is the initial password, So which has been written to this file as a safeguard. Now I'll be copying this password and putting it in the administrator password, and I'll click Continue. Now this will give me two options, either the suggested plugins or you can select the plugins you want to install. Now I'm going to go ahead with the suggested plugins because, because it is the best initial pack. You should have at least the basic things you need. Uh, this includes the folders plugin, the WSAP markup formatter plugin, build timeout plugin, credentials binding plugin, and a lot more. Now these are the minimum recommended requirements. It takes a couple of minutes for these plugins to get installed. So the installation is now complete. We will be creating our first admin user. I'll name the user admin and password is password. Password repeat and I'll name the user as admin user. And I'll give a dummy email address, admin at localhost.com. I'll click on Save and Finish. And then click on Start using Jenkins. So this is the Jenkins dashboard you are seeing right now. Now the first thing we want to do is create some users. So I'm going to go to Manage Jenkins. I'll go to Configure Global Security. Before you create users, you need to enable the Matrix Authentication plugin. Now, there are two ways of user authentication and authorization. In the authentication space, you have Jenkins' own user database. So if you're a small startup or a small company with, say, 5 to 10 users, you can use the Jenkins' uh, own user database. You can also have an LDAP server where you can connect and authenticate users. So if you already have an LDAP server in your infrastructure and you're setting up a Jenkins server, just integrate with that LDAP server and you should be fine. You need to populate the LDAP server IP and port. For this demo, we will be using the Jenkins own user database. Now, in terms of authorization, now logged in users can do anything. So I'll be switching that to matrix-based authentication where I need to specifically assign permissions based on whether I want it, overall, con credentials, agent, job, run, view, SCM permission. So I'll be adding the admin user to this matrix. And I'll be giving overall administrator privileges because this is the admin user. And I'll now be enabling sign up, where I'll be creating new users. I'll click on allow users to sign up and then click save. Now I'll log out of this user and create a new test user. So we can create an account. I'll create a read-only user. So I'll say read-only. Set my password as password. Password and then the name as read-only. 
read only at localhost.com. I'll click on sign up. Now I've signed up, but when I go to the top page, it says access denied. Read only is missing, the overall read permission. So I'll say log out. I'll go back to my admin user and give this user read permissions. So I'm logging back into my admin user. I'll click on manage Jenkins. Go to configure global security. In the matrix authentication, you see it's not added yet. So I'll add the read only user here, read only, then click on add. Now I have provided overall read permission. Then I'll click on apply and save. Now when I go to that user, it will be able to read every build. So this is a good practice. You can give read only access to your developers, to your testing team, so that they don't change any build. And you can have admin access yourself. The other thing I want to show you is the global tool configuration. So you can add in build binaries. So let's say you have a Java project. You can add the Java JDK here. Uh, you can name it Java. It will install automatically at the first build. And you can click on Agree and the Java SE Development Kit License Agreement. You can also add Git. So you click on Install automatically and Git will be installed. And you can add Gradle. You can name it Gradle. It will install this version automatically. So add Maven and Ant in a similar way. These are all build tools you use in your builds. So Maven, and you can also install a Docker binary. You can name it Docker and keep the installation root as uh, forward slash home, forward slash, or you can keep it as forward slash OPT. And click on Install Automatically. And then click on Apply and Save. So each of these binaries will be installed automatically based on whenever they are invoked from a build. Now, coming back to the build part, we'll be creating a couple of sample builds. So I'll click on Create New Jobs, and I'll say Sample, Hello World Build. And I'll click on Create as a Freestyle Project. You can have Pipeline, External Jobs, Multi-Configuration Projects, but for this we'll be focusing on the Freestyle Build. Freestyle Build gives you good flexibility in terms of what you want to do. You can modify the build according to your needs. Uh, so click on OK and it will show me a build configuration page. So this is the build configuration page where you can specify build triggers, build environment, post build actions, and source code management. So I'll be going here and adding a build step. And I'll say execute shell. So I'll be executing a shell command called hostname and I'll just click on save. When I click on save this build is configured. Now I want to run that hostname command, so when I click on Build Now, we'll see it's running that build. It's downloading the JDK. Because we have specified this, although we are not using this in the build, but it has to install JDK because we've specified that in the configuration. So as Jenkins initiates the first build, it downloads every configuration we specified in the Global Tool Configuration page. It takes a couple of minutes for this download to happen. Uh, it will then install Ant, Gradle, Maven, Docker, and Git. Still installing Java JDK. After the installation, it has successfully run the host name, and it is showing the Jenkins server here. Now I have the Hello World uh, repository here on GitHub, and I want to show you how to clone this repository using Jenkins. So this was a sample Hello World build. We'll be creating another build called Sample Clone Project. So you script your builder interface sample, Click on OK. I'll be using the Git plugin to clone that Git repository, so I'll go here and specify Git. I'll specify the HTTP credentials or the HTTP URL here in the build. And then I won't add any credentials because this is an open repository. I'll click on Save. I'll go and build this project. So you see the build is scheduled. You can see it has cloned this repository. Hello world git. So this is how you can clone projects. You can run your own shell scripts on top of that. You can also run Maven dependencies. Now if you go to Jenkins, you click on new item. Let's say we create a sample Maven build. 
We will use a freestyle project. Uh, click on OK. So you can go ahead and invoke a top level Maven target. So let's say there's a goal, hyphen P, PMD, semicolon PMD. Let's say you want to use the programmatic mistake detector. You can specify this, or you can use the programmatic mistake detector test if you want to use the unit. It all depends on how you write that into your POM.xml. And then you click on apply and save. So you have to make sure all of the logic in your build is continuous and it works seamlessly. This is all for the Jenkins introduction. Thanks a lot for your time. Hey, want to become an expert in cloud computing? Then subscribe to Simply Learn's channel and click here to watch more such videos. To nerd up and get certified in cloud computing, click here.